and that was it. And every couple of months, I get an email like this from him. And then one month, he sent me an email that was like, hey, I read this article of yours. Great work, as usual. Here's something that I found that you might be you know, interested in that goes along those lines. And it wasn't something of his. It was just some random thing from the Internet that, that I actually was interested in. And then as time went on, eventually, I get an email from him saying, hey, uh, you know, I don't know if, if, uh, if you've been getting my emails or whatever, but uh, I've been following your work and uh, I really enjoy your stuff. And, and I actually have something that I think might be interesting for you to write about. And at that point, I knew this guy, and I knew that he was legit a fan and that he was actually paying attention to my stuff. And also, his pitch was really dead on. And so I ended up getting lunch with him and writing about his company. And uh, and then I would take his emails, you know, for a couple of years from then, and, uh, you know, and he was a source for me as a journalist. And what he did that everyone else was not doing is he played the long game, realizing that if he just came out of nowhere, he's going to be just like everyone else. You know, if he said, hey, write about me, you know, bye, bye, bye. Uh, but by actually becoming interested in what I had to say and proving to me and to him that we were a good fit for each other in terms of, you know, writing about his company, uh, that paid off in the long run. So it's uh, this idea that often the right timing is not sort of being the fastest. It's being the most uh, observant about when's a good time for someone. That makes a lot of difference. And one last thing I'll say on this that is kind of my favorite analogy. They wrote about pro surfers and what makes the difference between, you know, the champions and, and the people that go home without a medal. And you'll notice that the best surfers in the world are not necessarily the best swimmers. You know, they're not at a certain point, everyone's good enough to, you know, to swim and to catch any wave. The best surfers in the world are the ones that show up to the beach early, like six in the morning and watch the waves for hours they can kind of recognize the patterns and figure out what their plan is so that they know when's the right time to strike. Surfers that are really skilled but don't win the tournaments are the ones that go out there and don't quite read the waves well enough. And that, I think, is, uh, is something that makes you know, the difference in sales, I guess, the difference between spraying and praying, right, sending the same message to a billion people and taking your time finding the people who are exactly right for you and then spending time building relationships, spending time getting to know them, customizing your pitch to them so that it's actually helpful to them. That makes a big difference. So it, it's not, you know, a hack in terms of speed, but it's uh, it's definitely a better way to optimize your time. And I, I think that, that backs up to that, you know, innovation lesson that, you know, the timing is not just about being first. It's, a, it's about knowing when to strike. That's a great point. It's funny that you mentioned it because on, the, on our last, discussion here we talked a lot about creating those cadences with prospects via newsletters and enticing them to sign up for an ongoing discussion um i think yeah and i think you know i i know that at Insable, part of the of what you guys do as i understand is identify to people hey this big change has happened to you know to someone or some company that you're interested in those kinds of triggers, knowing that, hey, they just moved offices or, hey, you know, there was an outage or, you know, uh, something happened. If you've been paying attention to your prospects and you've gotten to know them and then you can identify that this is the time when I may actually be able to help them rather than spam them, that's super useful. And, you know, that's the sort of thing that uh, that you either get lucky on because, you know, you just are throwing out sales pitches or you know exactly what you're doing because you're, you're actually trying to uh, understand them first. Yeah, that's a great point. I didn't even think about that. Um, but it's kind of like the analogy that you shared of watching the waves. Um, if you sit back and watch these changes taking place within these organizations and watch the industry trends and combine the two, you'd be much more mm -hmm. effective when you're talking to them. Absolutely. Do you feel like the digital age has uh, has made it more difficult to establish these deeper relationships? Because it seems like these ongoing conversations that we have with clients extend over a longer period of time, which is helpful for, in terms of timing, but it also seems like it takes a little bit longer to establish that, that relationship and comfort with these clients via um, digital communications rather than in-person meetings. Is that some, does, that, does that make sense? I think, yeah, I think it does. I think it's, you know, it's becoming 
a best practice, right? To to uh, to target and to try and you know and establish relationships. I think the it's getting difficult because more people are doing it. I think the the principle that underlies it is really solid. Um, but yeah, it's it's uh, I think it's easy to to kind of take this idea and then waste people's time and waste your time, right? Yeah. I, I think it does take a measure of prudence, you know, and and wisdom and kind of being honest with yourself about, you know, are you are you wasting people's time? Are you saving them time? I think in general, trying to take an approach where whatever you are sending someone or asking of someone, you know, in terms of them spending time with you or getting to know you, you getting to know them, that it's always net benefiting them in the process rather than kind of eking away seconds and hours and minutes of their, you know, of their work day. Um, I mean, I think that's the challenge. And that's, you know, like with my friend who I talked about with his, his email list, his emails are so useful that it doesn't feel like it's wasting your day when you open them. You know, a lot of times we open our email to get through it, right? It's work. Um, his stuff that he sends out is actually helping you work better. Um, and so that makes it feel like, uh, you know, like a net gain. So I think that kind of mentality is good. And, you know, a lot of people take this idea and they do it. They do, you know, content marketing as a way to build relationships with sales prospects, but they don't offer stuff that's actually good, that's actually useful, that's actually targeted. And then it's, it's that same old thing. It's just more kind of more work. So, yeah, it's hard. I also am a big fan of uh, meeting people in person when possible just because that tends to be just more scarce Sort of way to get to know someone these days versus doing everything over email and the internet, um, which is you know even with my story of the that kid Danny who pitched me the the story about his company, getting a sit down over lunch eventually took some work and some time on his part, but once you've met someone in person and you you know you've been able to jive with them, it's a lot easier to take their calls um, and to not ignore them. And because uh, that human sort of face-to-face relationship does count for a lot in this day when, yeah, when it, it's harder and harder because of all the noise and all of the spam coming at us. Yeah, I know it's true. I think uh, the combination will definitely, um, you know, in, before you can sit down with somebody, you really need to build a little bit of momentum with the relationship enough mm-hmm. so that you can actually merit a conversation in person. Now, another thing I really liked about uh, Smart Cuts was the idea of taking risks. Um, what are your thoughts in terms of growing business and taking risks? Um, can you share some insights about that? Yeah. Um, so the, the chapter where I mostly focused on taking risks was about sort of the, uh, the fail fast, fail often mentality that Silicon Valley kind of promotes and – it's kind of picking apart, you know, when is fair, failure useful and when is it not useful? Uh, when is it good? When is it bad? And, uh, you know, there's a couple of things that, you know, now is a good time to build a business, I think, for a few reasons uh, from that standpoint. One is there's so little stigma anymore to starting a business that doesn't work out. So we have the luxury of treating failure as learning. You know, there's not this, like, you're outcast forever, um, you know, because you, you tried to start a company and it didn't work or, you know, if you, you know, you fail sort of in your job, you know, you try some big initiative and it doesn't work out, the uh, the learnings and the skills that, that you develop along the way and, and doing like a real kind of self-reflection and post-mortem can actually be a selling point for your next thing that you try. Um, there's very little social risk, which makes it a lot easier to, to not even think about failure anymore, to think about everything as learning. Um, and, and that makes risk taking a lot more palatable. Um, there's a few things that, you know, that I, I found really interesting when I was doing the research on this idea. One is that in general, humans are really good at externalizing the reasons for their failures. So you take a risk and it doesn't work out and we're really likely to blame it on the weather or the referees or, you know, the competition or someone else's mistake or the environment, you know, when we lose. And, and that's just part of our psychology. So we can go home at night and sleep. You know, we can live with ourselves if it wasn't our fault. I in particular wrote about surgeons who, you know, who are trying these surgeries and it doesn't work out. 
it's really hard to sleep at night if, you know, your patient dies on the operating table, if you blame yourself. But if you do that, you're a lot less likely to learn from the failures, from the mistakes, from the risks that you take than if you are more, you internalize the reasons for, for your mistakes. But that's really psychologically painful. So actually the best thing to do, the best way that, say, a surgeon learns how to do a new surgery is to watch other people make mistakes, watch other people take risks, and whether they fail or succeed, that is a lot more helpful if you're really, because it, it's a lot easier to, you know, to pinpoint what went wrong and, and what you should do better if you uh, do that kind of studying. And so I think, you know, and I think in terms of taking big risks in business these days, it's actually quite easy to de-risk a lot of the big, uh, what used to be big risks, because we have a lot more access to stories of other companies, of other people, you know, taking these kinds of risks and, and what went wrong and, uh, and what went right and being able to kind of learn from those patterns makes it a lot easier to, you know, to take risks ourselves because we're, we're learning the honest lessons. The other thing I'd say is if uh, like the whole thing with lateral thinking is about finding the assumptions that are inherent to whatever you're working on and then questioning those assumptions. So I think a really good technique or I guess method for when you're starting a business, or you're starting a new initiative, or you're making a new product, is to actually sit down and list out every assumption that you're making that has to be true for this to work out. And, uh, you know, even down to people have to have a pulse in order to buy this. You know, as silly as that sounds, that kind of helps you establish all of the things that have to be true in order for something to work. And, uh, and lateral thinking is basically about asking what if, this assumption didn't need to be true. What if, you know, what if we rejected this or what if we approached this assumption in a different way? And actually I think a good method is listing out all the assumptions, questioning those, uh, saying, do we really have to do things this way in order to, you know, to get the result we want and then rank ordering what are the most risky. And I think these days, given the technology that we have, it's a lot easier to test uh, assumptions for businesses than it was before. You can, you know, you can test things on paper, kind of the whole lean startup thing that everyone's been talking about for years. Before you build the website and the app, you know, draw it out on a piece of paper and have people try and make sense of it. So, you know, you know, you have a better sense of what, uh, you know, of what to build before you spend all the money doing it, before you take the risk financially and, and time-wise. So I think, you know, maybe the answer to your question really isn't uh, how do we get more comfortable taking in big risks, but it's a lot easier, I think, when you, you think with this kind of innovation mindset to get rid of the risk, to make it not so risky to do things. And then, yeah, it's just the way the world is now. It really is okay. Uh, you, you're going to be able to live and go on if you put your heart and soul into something and it doesn't work out, um, especially in America. There's so little stigma and just kind of the, the – net that we have underneath us in terms of being able to pick up and, and start again is, is pretty strong these days. So and that makes me happy. I think a lot of people are starting businesses and taking chances because they see companies started by people who, you know, are their age, um, you know, whatever that age is, uh, making things that, that then everybody uses and that grows. And, and then we see the stories and the things that don't work out. And if we really look at them, that can help us to, to make our own stuff better. That's a great point. Um, that reminds me a lot of the, the concepts known as optionality, mm -hmm. which a lot of times we're not, we don't have to know how to do something. We don't have to be smarter than a lot of the other entrepreneurs. We just have to be able to be willing to test and fail. And mm -hmm. we'll outgrow anybody if we're willing to experiment. And that's where that optionality concept comes from. It's not about knowing where to go. It's about testing and figuring out what works. Yes, and, and when you do it with that mindset, it's so much less painful to let go of your initial ideas. Because the goal is to find the thing that works, not to prove that you're right. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. In the beginning of the call, you talked a little bit about lateral thinking. I don't know if you could share real briefly about uh, what that is and how we can apply that maybe to sales. Yeah, so lateral thinking is basically approaching problems from different angles than everyone else approaches them. This is essentially 
what it's about. It's sort of the, you know, the Trojan horse rather than trying to knock over the castle doors, hide in the wooden horse, that kind of thing, if you want to get into the castle. Um, so lateral thinking is about looking at problems, approaching them from different angles, uh, playing the game differently than is played by everyone else. And so there's, it's basically about teaching yourself to think differently. And when you apply that to sales, there's a, you know, there's a couple things. I, I sort of touched on them, but the, the things that, that I think really apply the most are one is this idea of questioning assumptions, the way things are done. Often we approach our jobs, you know, such as in sales, uh, doing them the way that everyone else does them. And I think stepping back and asking why a million times, why do it this way? Why does it make sense to do it this way and not some other way? Um, you know, questioning the assumptions that you have, I think in general, that's the, the kind of process that can help your pitch stand out and help you get attention. Um, I think the, uh, you know, talking about the surfers studying the waves, I, uh, I did this thing a few years ago where I sent a thousand cold emails to CEOs of uh, Fortune 1000 companies and uh, to try and get them to respond to basically a, a pitch and, uh, and the experiment basically showed that the only uh, the only emails that worked out were the ones where uh, where there's actual research done to customize them to that CEO and what was going on in his or her sort of company and life right now. The the emails that were more uh, canned, you know, with uh, testing different versions of the pitch, different versions of the subject line, and then and all the things that that we tested there were so poorly responded to versus the ones that were really customized. And so, you know, that's, I think when I think about lateral thinking, it's about attacking problems in a custom way every time. So whether that problem is getting the attention of a CEO who you're trying to pitch or some other thing, you know, if the problem is trying to invent, uh, you know, a solution to your customer's problem, going with a custom approach that starts from the ground up is, kind of the only way that you're going to make something different. And there's times when it makes sense to do the tried and true thing um, for speed's sake, but if you're trying to, to stand out, that's really not going to work. The other thing that I'll say in terms of lateral thinking that I think applies pretty well to sales is uh, I talk about this idea of finding unconventional paths to climb the ladder, you know, in say like a career or in, in terms of trying to make a sale or to get bigger and better customers. And, uh, and I think thinking of that sort of climb to the top in a less linear way um, is really useful. And, and I think uh, there's a couple of examples that I could give. One is if you, if the CEO of the company of your, you know, prospect company is really the person who's going to sign the check and that's the person you really need to get to sign off on someone on something, if that's the person you're trying to get to, emailing that person directly may not be the best path. Emailing and working your way up or actually meeting someone who is much further down the ladder and working your way up from there to the CEO might actually be a, a way better path. Conversely, if uh, really your buyer, your prospect is someone who's, you know, in middle management or, or a, you know, a user in a certain department, actually emailing the CEO and asking who's the, you know, the right person for this kind of question is a pretty clever approach because if the CEO says this is the person or if they forward you to that person, the person they send you to is a lot more likely to listen to your pitch because it came through their CEO. So kind of thinking through what are the alternate ways you can get to someone that aren't kind of the direct way, um, that is, is sort of the essence of lateral thinking. And I, I that second one I use a lot as a journalist, actually, when I'm doing my own form of sales, which is pitching editors. You know, if I'm, I'm trying to get an editor at the New Yorker to, you know, to take my pitch and I haven't, you know, met her before, I'll often email someone who I do know or who I know is a lot more accessible, someone who's new, who's not getting spammed all the time. I'll email them and I'll say, hey, who's the right person for this pitch? Hoping that they send me to the editor that I want. And then when they say, oh, it's so-and-so, then I send the email that says, so-and-so, your colleague, referred me. And that email is a lot more likely to get opened because it's got a person, a relationship attached, you know, in the subject line 
or it might actually be a forward, chances are that busy editor is a lot more likely to read my email and my pitch than if I just directly emailed her. Um, so I, I don't know if, uh, if what I'm getting at makes sense with this idea that um, lateral thinking is finding an, another way through the door, and uh, and it's often you know, not the direction that you think is sideways, it's from the top, it's from the bottom. Yeah, that's a good point. We've done a few experiments here with <clears throat> email campaigns and found that uh, the indirect route is typically the better route because <clears throat> when you have internal referrals from a company, people pay attention to that. Mm -hmm. And so finding uh, the weak point where you can at least get somebody to, to, to listen to you um, and when they make an introduction, there's a, somewhat of a social obligation for that person to actually listen to their co-employee. That's a great point. Yeah, and don't. I, I think one caveat I would say is, uh, you know, don't set up a landmine for that that poor person who you know is connecting you. Making sure that you do your research and you customize pitch so that they don't get in trouble for sending that over to the person. That at least. Even if it's a no, at least it's not a, a waste of time. You know, it's trying to be helpful, trying to make that person look helpful to their colleague. I think uh, it definitely wins you points in the long run, and is the right thing to do. Yeah, that's that's absolutely true. You can't burn your bridges. It also reminds yeah. me a little bit about the challenger sell, <clears throat> challenging the customer about the way they're thinking today, and mm -hmm. trying to get to to go beyond just what everybody else is doing, and so creating a new dimension in their world and, and, and things like that and having mm -hmm. situation knowledge, I think that'll that's a huge impact in terms of actually having influence with the customer and having them listen to you. Absolutely. Yeah, good point. So I know we're running out of time. I was hoping you could share with us a little bit about what you're up to these days before we uh, wrap up and uh, open it up for Q&A. Sure. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, I have a few things going on. So about a year ago, I, uh, I stepped aside at Contently, the startup company I was at for eight years. I'm now a uh, founder at large, and I'm working on some new projects. My, my most recent book came out last year. It's called Dream Teams, and it's basically about uh, applying these ideas of making breakthroughs together. So it's about how different people together can, uh, can push each other to think differently and kind of how, to, how to make a team that's hyper-effective. Um, not just a team that's happy. And, uh, and so that's been going really well. I've been doing a bunch of personal writing and um, I'm working on a couple of, uh, of secret television projects right now <laughs> that uh, I'm, I'm trying to do the same thing that I, I write about, applying the lessons I'm learning from what I've done in the past a little bit to a, sort of a sideways industry. So taking the stuff that we've learned it contently and that I've learned about innovation and lateral thinking and applying that to some stuff in television that uh, you know, hopefully later this year will will come out and I'll be able to talk about more. But uh, trying to, to live what I preach, I guess. And, um, yeah, that's, I, that's just about what's going on right now. Nice. Well, we'll definitely have to have you join us again here in, in a year or two or All right. sooner. But uh, we'll go ahead and open up for Q&A. If anybody has any questions, I know we're um, half an hour in, but we'd love to, if, if you're in the chat, um, please feel free to throw a few questions out to Shane, and we'll take those now. So the first question from Michelle, uh, she was wondering, uh, where do I get started? Like she's trying to, uh, she's, she's trying to grow her business and just trying to, to say, you know, there's so many different options. Where do I get started? Um, well, I mean, that's a big, big question and, uh, and a broad question, I would say, but it's, uh, <laughs> yeah, I think the, the first place that I would get started is, um, I wrote a couple of things that you can find if you go to my website and click on the articles page and go to, to entrepreneurship. Um, I have some articles on kind of my, my philosophy on, on getting started with companies. Um, but I think figuring out what's the purpose, uh, what, you know, your purpose is first and starting from there. So what is it you're really trying to do and why? 
and uh, and abstracting that away from your idea for you know what you what's your strategy what you're trying to build. And I think starting there, getting a real good picture of uh, of what you want to do and why, and then kind of the exercise after that is envisioning you know if we're successful at you know going after this purpose in the science fiction future of the world, however many years from now, what does our company look like or what does that look like, you know, the, the impact that we can have. Kind of going through that sort of long term, this is the stuff that, that you don't want to change. Um, this is the stuff that, you know, that you care about, that however you get to that, that's where you think there's, a, there's an important business to be done. And, and usually that will revolve around solving a problem or, you know, helping people or, or whatever it is. Um, the boiling down that core. And then after that, it's sort of the, uh, you know, the exercise of developing a strategy for, you know, what is the product and what is the business that makes money from that product that leads to that vision and that, you know, because you care about that purpose. And then, you know, kind of starting with this mindset that whatever the strategy is probably will change a lot and being open to that because you, you're firm in that, uh, kind of what you're trying to do in the long run that uh, you are allowing yourself the room to, you know, to, to experiment and to change kind of the, that, you know, business proverb of uh, being stubborn on vision, but flexible on strategy uh, that, uh, that really helps from sort of a starting place. And I think if you're not really clear on the purpose and, and you don't at least have a good idea pretty early on, on kind of, what that concretely would look like if you're successful, then, uh, then I think you don't really want to get started with the experiments because, you know, it's kind of like going on a hike and not being sure where you're going, right? So that's where I'd start. And then after that, I think it's the exercise of, uh, you know, if you've identified a problem, you've identified, you know, potential solutions to that, and then going through what are the things that I'm assuming, that we're assuming, that are true about this problem? What are we assuming that are true about the people that have it? What are we assuming are true about the possible solutions that we're making? And then, you know, kind of poking those with a sharp stick to see uh, which of these things uh, might not be true, which of these things are most important or are most vulnerable that we need to, you know, to prove or test first. Uh, That's kind of the general approach that I would take. Like I said, I have some articles where I write about that you go to my website and click on, on articles and then entrepreneurship. Uh, but I hope that helps. No, that's great. I'll make sure that we share a few of those articles um, as a follow-up to today's call. Um, and out, out of respect to your time, Shane, I'm, we're going to go with one more question from Dan. Okay. And, his, and I think this relates to the email campaign that you were talking about. But his question was, is there ever a place for calling as many people as possible in outbound sales in today's environment? I think he's, what he's saying is um, in terms of, prospecting, are we looking at, should I approach it from massive calling and trying to reach as many people as possible? Should I be more strategic? I think it, it very much will depend on what you're selling and how easy it is to buy um, and, you know, how busy and available the people that you'd be calling are. I think that higher price point, higher consideration products, uh, you are going to have a harder time with that cold call thing um, than uh, than if you're 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 calling people that could be buying now, you know, buying with a credit card, that sort of thing. Uh, I think you know, I think it depends. The I'm trying to think like the yardstick that I would use is how disruptive is that to people, and what's the you know the percentage of time that that really is going to be effective versus how much time it takes. And, and actually kind of do some math, you know, if I can call 100 people in a day, one of those people will work out. Is it more effective to spend seven days figuring out better targets so that I can call, you know, 20 people a day and 10 of them work out? You know, I, I think doing that kind of math and maybe even doing that test, right? Spend a week doing one and spend a week doing the other. Uh, that will pay off more than just – you know, it's easier to just pick up the phone and call than to do the research and the thinking. Um, And so I I wouldn't default to that just because it feels like hard work. Um, I would make sure that that's actually the best use of your time. 
Yeah, it goes back to the optionality idea of hacking growth mm. through mm. Uh, experiments. But uh, we'll definitely do another call about that, Dan, to kind of talk about what we're seeing and run a few experiments on our end to see if we can help you answer that question a little bit more effectively. So out of respect to everyone's time, especially Shane's, um, really appreciate everyone joining us, especially Shane. Thanks again. We'll hopefully have you on this call soon and hopefully that uh, we hope you have a fun time in brazil while it's nice and warm there and um, we'll be in touch but again thanks everyone uh, for joining us and uh, we'll see you guys in two weeks thank you everybody thanks shane take care everyone